So there's something particular about the halls of Congress that when ordinary citizens or people who can ordinarily, you know, balance a budget, no problem, when they get in there, all of a sudden all bets are off. And it's not just off in random directions. It's only off in the direction of deficit. Welcome to Act in Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. On November 7th, 2022, the jackpot for the Powerball lottery reached an astonishing $2.05 billion. Even after the federal and state governments take their piece of that, the winner will still be the recipient of a life-changing amount of money, more than enough to last an entire lifetime. But if the winner of that 2.05 billion Powerball jackpot was the United States federal government, they'd burn through that enormous sum of money in just over a week. How did the federal budget get this large? What does that budget say about our political system and the desires and priorities of the public and of politicians? In this episode, I sit down with Dr. David Hebert, chair of the economics department and associate professor of economics at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, to discuss his recent article for the American Institute for Economic Research, using the Powerball to explain the size and scope of the federal budget. David Hebert graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics from Hillsdale College in 2009, and then attended George Mason University, where he earned a master's in 2011 and doctorate in 2014. During graduate school, he was an F.A. Hayek Fellow with the Mercatus Center and a fellow with the Department of Health Administration and Policy, and also worked with the Joint Economic Committee in the U.S. Congress. Since graduating, he has worked as an assistant professor at Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan, and Troy University in Troy, Alabama, and was also a fellow with the U.S. Senate Budget Committee, where he authored a comprehensive report on federal budget process reform. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Dave Hebert, welcome to Acton Line. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So you have a piece that you published at uh, the American Institute for Economic Research that took a look at taxes, spending, and Powerball winnings. Yeah. Um, are these your Powerball winnings you're looking at, uh, <laughs> how they would they, be disposed by the yeah. state? <laughs> I wish they were. And I, I will say that had I won, Acton would have gotten a, a sizable donation. But well, we'll, we'll look forward to that in the well, future. You, you when, didn't get one, so yeah, I must uh, not have won. Must not have won. <laughs> well, uh, at least you tried. I did. Uh, describe what you discovered in taking a look at the um, – there was a recent $2.04 billion Powerball prize. Right. Enormous amount of money. Yeah. Uh, so when you dug into this, what did you find? Yeah. So what I found uh, or what I, what I try to do with this piece is couch federal spending in terms of Powerball winnings. So the idea here is thinking in terms of billions or trillions of dollars is is not really possible for you know our organic mind. Like we just can't fathom numbers that large. And so we try to come up with ways to kind of make these numbers more relatable. Uh, so we'll do things like say, you know, if you stacked a trillion one dollar bills on top of each other, how tall would that tower be? Right? And the answer is 63,700 miles, right? which is a big number. right? Uh, or if you took the federal budget, which I believe was somewhere around six and a quarter trillion dollars for 2022 uh, and stacked you know, dollar bills, uh, that many dollar bills on top of one another, you would go to the moon and almost all the way back to Earth. Right? And so thinking about numbers this size is just really hard. And so what I wanted to do in this piece is take the U.S. federal budget – and try to put it in terms of something that we were all familiar with, in this case, the Powerball. And so what I found uh, were things like uh, if Congress won the Powerball and spent every penny of it on education, right? So for 2022, Congress spent $73 billion on education. Uh, So the $2.04 billion would last for about 10 days. 
If they instead spent money on defense, which the defense budget for 2022 was 714 billion dollars, uh, defense spending uh, that would last you know 24 hours and 30 minutes. Uh, social security spending, we could fund social security for 16 hours. Uh, and if we thought about Medicare and Medicaid, uh, Congress could fund uh, those programs for 14 hours and 16 minutes with the $2.04 billion Powerball winning. Uh, so trying to put these, these massive federal spending programs into terms that ordinary people can understand was kind of the goal of this piece. And to me, the, the results were just absolutely mind-blowing. As you looked into this, um, is it just the – I've wondered if it's a rhetorical problem and how much of a rhetorical problem it is, right? Because I think this is getting at what you discovered here, that we have a hard time conceptualizing what these numbers mean when you start having to actually write the word behind them yeah. to express them rather than write out all the zeros. So as you were saying that, I was reminded that I just – someone pointed this out to me recently that um, a thousand or a million seconds mm – -hmm is, I believe, what, about three months? Yeah. And a billion seconds is almost 32 years. Right. <laughs> uh, it does put that into context, the difference between all of them. Uh, yeah. Is it – how much of this is a rhetorical problem? How much of this is the fact that people have a difficult time wrapping their heads around numbers so large that it's you know beyond the point where you can count anymore if it's a million, if it's a billion, if it's a trillion? You yeah. know, it's, it's beyond – easy conception, so you just blur the lines, you think they're closer together than they actually are. Yeah, so there is a bit of that going on in here. And, and that, to me, is why I wanted to couch all these spending programs in terms of Powerball ticket, you know, winnings, right? So the idea here, what I'm, what I'm really trying to, to talk about with this piece is an age-old debate in public finance. You know, does Congress or do governments have a revenue problem or do they have a spending problem? Right. And so like when you're in a deficit, right, it means that you have spent more money than you actually have. So how do you solve that problem? Well, from an accounting perspective, right, there's two ways. You can either increase the money you have available to spend or you can decrease the amount of money you spend. Right. So accounting wise, there's no real answer to that question of whether Congress has a spending or revenue problem. But from an economic perspective, there's absolutely an answer. And the answer seems to be clear that we have a massive spending problem. Right? Congress doesn't have a revenue problem. It's a pure spending problem. And we can tell this actually fairly simply just by looking at the behavior of the people in Congress who are in charge of the spending. You know, when's the last time you heard about a congressman or congressperson uh, having a hard time financially? Right, failing to pay their mortgage or being behind on their bills. Right? You've probably never heard of that, and I haven't either. Right? So it's not like these people are incapable of balancing a budget in their own lives. Right? And so now we have to ask this question of like, why are there persistent deficits? Right? So one answer might be that the challenge is just very hard because these numbers are so big. Right? And that could be true. But if that were the case, then we would expect some years Congress is going to run a surplus and some years Congress will run a deficit. And that's not what we see. In the last 50 years, if memory serves me correctly, there have been seven times where there's been a surplus. And that's including four of the Clinton years, right? So three years outside of Clinton, right? And those surpluses were not that large. They were a couple hundred million dollars or a couple, maybe a couple dozen billion at most, right? But certainly not on the order of, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars or close to a trillion dollar deficit, okay? So it can't be that the problem's hard. Maybe the answer lies in the fact that it's a group, and group dynamics oftentimes produce weird results. But that can't really be true because plenty of groups around the world can balance their budget. The Acton Institute, for example. You guys seem to do a, a fantastic job running a balanced budget. So it's not about group dynamics. So there's something particular about the halls of Congress that when ordinary citizens or people who can ordinarily, you know, balance a budget, no problem, when they get in there, all of a sudden all bets are off. And it's not just off in random directions. It's only off in the direction of deficit. And that was the question that I'm really trying to get at. And that's why I think looking at these, these spending programs in terms of Powerball winnings so that, one, we can wrap our heads around just how big of, a pro of spending programs these are. Why that really, to me, evidences that it is a spending problem. It is not a revenue problem. 
Do you think that this is where you may meet the limit of? So, it, you come to our if you come to our Acton University conference mm-hmm. in June, we have uh, one of the core classes we offer is on the economic way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> do you think that this is a case where you start pushing up against the the boundaries of the economic way of thinking of being impactful on this? And and I mean that in this way. Yeah. Uh, from the economic perspective, I agree with you that there is this is a spending problem, not a revenue problem. Mm-hmm. From uh, I'll, I'll compare this to kind of the same way that the the CDC has only one objective is the Center for D- Disease Control and Prevention. Yeah. So they would pursue that one objective at the cost of everything else. Right. And there's a reason why we elect politicians, uh, we elect leaders to make decisions where they have to take multiple things into consideration, yep. not just the one objective of the CDC. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- thinking of that, Politicians have uh, a different decision-making rubric here, and especially given the signals that they've been given by the voters. So yeah. on one hand, <clears throat> I think you can absolutely obviously make the argument that it is a spending problem, not a revenue problem. Mm-hmm. However, <clears throat> you have conflicting demands from the polis. You have a desire for programs like Medicaid, like mm-hmm. Medicare, like Social Security to exist and provide the benefits that they do. And you also have an overall aggregate desire from uh, the polis for lower taxes. Yeah. So in a way, you have both problems. You yeah. have incredibly expensive programs mm-hmm. that we do not – raise enough revenue to fully fund right. that are in demand. But we also have a very low demand for the kind of revenue raising mechanisms that would be necessary to make the whole thing balance. Yeah. So I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, right? And it's actually, I think it's even more severe than you might have uh, laid out. So if you think about the congressional debt limit, so there is a, a congressional debt limit. There's a, a limit on how much debt Congress is allowed to authorize the president and the treasury to, to have, right? But Congress gets to raise that limit whenever they want, right? Now, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of instances where Congress has hit the debt limit and the government has, quote unquote, shut down, right? And usually this is used as sort of a bargaining chip typically by the Republican Party, to try to get some bill passed that ordinarily wouldn't get passed. But at the same time, we know that Congress is going to raise the debt limit at some point. Like it'll, It will get raised. Uh, typically, the workers that were furloughed get back pay. So it's not even uh, an unpaid vacation for them. It's a paid vacation. And so imagine for a minute, right, that you had a credit card, right? A credit card is something where you have pre-approved debt, right? You are allowed to borrow money from Chase, American Express, whomever, but you get to decide the credit limit. You are declared to be a hero if you use this credit card, right? If you max it out or if you just use it in general, you're declared an economic hero. If you don't use it, you are declared to be a villain who clearly doesn't care about people. In favor of austerity. Yeah, in favor of austerity, you know, putting people over – or I'm sorry, putting austerity over people or whatever the phrase was in the last few years. And so if you think about this mythical credit card – and oh, by the way, uh, you get to decide when you pay that credit card back. Right? There's no late fees. There's no penalties, nothing like that. There's an interest rate, but you get to determine what the interest rate is as well. And so if you think about having that mythical credit card, you know, what would you do with it? Right? Well, of course you would spend money on it. Right? There's no reason not to. And that's exactly what we have with the U.S. federal budget process. We have a system in place that basically rewards spending Right, because obviously in the framework of Washington, D.C., more spending equals more jobs. Right, And every month we get the jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and every month we see the president or whomever talking about the latest jobs report and how great you know, 100,000 jobs or 400,000 jobs are. And I don't want to diminish that. It's great that there are more jobs. But at the same time, we have to look at the spending that Congress had to do to get those 400,000 jobs. And if that spending is you know, millions of dollars per $40,000 a year job, there's some waste going on, tons of it. And so what I want to think about are, are the incentives that Congress people have, right? Their number one incentive, their number one goal is not to serve the people. It's to get reelected. Sometimes serving the people is what gets them reelected. And that's great. We want people like that. But oftentimes, it's the people that get into office who are willing to increase spending on their district and also cut taxes. 
And if you can do both, you have a much better chance at getting elected. After all, think about your own personal life. Would you vote for the person who said, hey, Eric, I'm going to raise your taxes and I'm going to cut spending on all the things you care about? Right? You'd be like, no, I'm not going to vote for that person, especially if someone else came around and said, hey, Eric, I'm going to cut your taxes because, you know, we've burdened you enough with federal taxes. You are paying more than your fair share. And because I also care about the same things you care about, I'm going to make sure that Congress spends more money on the things that you want to see done. Right? You're going to vote for that second person probably 10 times out of 10. And I would too. This isn't a, a you know, time to bash Eric or anyone listening, right? Everyone would do this, in, in theory at least. And so when you have a system that rewards spending, that rewards cutting taxes, right, it's basically set up to fail. It's set up to have exactly what we see now, massive deficits, massive spending, and persistent debt. So what do we do about that? Yeah. What uh, it, do you think? Um, so obviously, the the approach of the piece is to put the numbers in context to try to get people's heads around the idea of exactly how much is being spent on these programs. Right. Um, but how do you deal with that problem of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs? Yeah, this is the challenge of democracy, right? Is how do you how do you simultaneously empower a government to do the things that we need it to do? without also empowering it to do bad things or to give in to the temptations of popular whims. And so one answer that is fairly commonly given is bringing education to the masses, informing citizenry about what's going on in a way that they can understand it. And so what I'm trying to do in this is piece is a modest attempt to try to inform more people about just how much money is actually being spent. Because we hear all these things that say, you know, don't you want to solve problem X, Y, and Z? And it's like, of course I do. It's like, all right, well, you know, my bill is only going to cost, you know, $800 billion. And we're like, okay, that sounds great. I have no concept of how much $800 billion is uh, because I can't, most people uh, are incapable of really understanding numbers above about 10,000, right? That's like our limit, our mental capacity for understanding numbers is about 10,000. And so anything above that sounds all the same, right? 800 billion, 8 billion, that's the same number, whatever, right? It's like the, the transition from it, – it, it, it reminds me of when TARP was passed. Yeah. Uh, and the if you've seen, there's a movie that was made about the all the machinations of trying to get uh, TARP passed. I think it was called Too Big to Fail. Yeah. Um, and one of the big concerns was they didn't want it to be a billion dollars. Right. They wanted it to be under that because they thought the reaction to it being a billion dollars, just going from talking about millions or even hundreds of millions to billions, yeah. there's a psychological impact that it was going to have on people. So it comes at like eight hundred and seventy eight uh, yeah. million dollars. Yeah. And then we see within you. So that is two thousand and eight. Right. We see in the interceding years that we have now gotten to talking about trillion dollar spending bills and right. hardly anyone bats an eye. Right. Well, this is the same logic of, you know, you see all those late night infomercials for the products that you don't need, but you think you do, right? And, and that all, seemed kind of cool. Yeah, and they seem kind of cool, right? And they might work, they might not, but they're all, you know, 1995 plus shipping and handling, right? Yeah. Well, there's a psychological limit at 20, right, that says, hey. Same deal under- with the nine tenths of a cent on yeah, gasoline. same yeah, thing, it right? It brings it down a penny in people's minds, so yep. it's just one number lower. Yeah, and so there are, we do understand like categorical things like billion versus trillion. So we understand like when you cross that line, that's a big number. But within that range of, of billions, hard for us to imagine differences. Within the range of trillions, hard for us to imagine differences. We understand a trillion is bigger than 800 billion, uh, but we don't understand like by how much, right? Yeah. Uh, and so- Really trying to take two things that people are aware of, right? The fact that we spend money on education and the Powerball and just compare those two and let people see like, wow, you know, $2.04 billion. I mean, who among us didn't imagine what it would be like to win that Powerball? There is not a person in this this country that didn't think about it unless they were living under a rock and didn't know about the Powerball, right? Every single American probably imagined what it would be like to win. And so now when you take that – that imagination you've got about how your life would be amazing and you say, hey, by the way, that spending would only last a few hours in Congress, right? That was the real piece. I mean, I think uh, the 
the uh, the figure that I, I think is really alarming is that Congress spends the equivalent of the Powerball, so that two point oh four billion dollars. They spend that every two hours and forty seven minutes year round around the clock without stop. Right, that works out to just under two hundred thousand dollars of federal spending every single second. Right, that's insane. That's enough to feed. That's enough to put to make five. Full like household salaries. The average, the median salary is about forty eight thousand dollars a year uh, as of two thousand twenty one, and so that's almost enough to have five households be fully employed every single second, right? All year, all day, all week, all the time, and so trying to relate these massive numbers and bring them into into our understanding, I think is is the first step toward getting people to understand just how much money is being spent and just how much waste there must be. Because here's the other kind of statistic. The federal like congressional approval rating is 21%, right? So you're telling me that $200,000 a second means that only one in five Americans is happy with the product that's being sold to us? That seems ridiculous. Right, we should demand better, and part of the answer here is to make us aware of just how much is being spent and how little, frankly, we're getting in return for it. And I don't want to diminish the contributions of Congress. Clearly, there are problems that that are being at least somewhat addressed, but they could probably be addressed better or more efficiently or uh, less inefficiently, at the very least. Right for fewer dollars, and we'd all be just as happy. We might even get up to two in five Americans being happy with Congress. Wouldn't that be amazing? To change the demand side of all of this, what changes do you think would be necessary? So, as we point out, it's a problem that you know mm-hmm. people want you know people want to have their cake and they want to eat it too. Right. Right. So. What kind of changes would be necessary? You had this proposal from uh, a very politically uh, inopportune at the time and problematic proposal from Senator Rick Scott from Florida that basically said one of the problems in this country is that not everybody has skin in the game in terms of paying taxes. Yeah. We should change that to make sure that people have skin in the game. So it's yeah. the kind of it, it is the quintessential example of the kind of thing that actually does make sense on its face. Yeah. Everybody should have some kind of an investment in the federal government. Mm -hmm. Um, But on the other hand, it is completely a political non-starter. Right. So, you know, this is another good example. I heard this in a podcast interview I was listening to yesterday that you'll get consensus amongst – I find these interesting, uh, at least the point of the podcast. It's interesting where you get consensus among experts on certain things Mm -hmm. that are just generally perceived to be the opposite uh, of – by the general public. Yeah. An example of this was – most economists will agree that you know taxing income, taxing productivity mm-hmm. is not the best means to fund something like you know the the, the yeah. federal government of the United States. Right. A consumption tax, which is based on people's actual behavior, right. is probably a much better way to go about it. Yeah. Try convincing three hundred and sixty <laughs> some million, or three hundred thirty, three hundred sixty million people yeah. that it's a good idea to tax every single purchase that they make. Right. Uh, it's a hard sell. It's a very hard sell. So what do you do to try to address that demand side of things? Yeah. So James Buchanan and Richard Wagner have a book that – or had a book that came out in 1977 called Democracy and Deficit, The Political Economy of Lord John Maynard Keynes. And the thrust of that book, most people read that book and, and take away exactly what, what you said, right? Politicians have an incentive to spend money uh, and to tax very little. Right, And that's not a bad interpretation or a bad reading of that book. But what the book is really about is the transformation of the American people. Right, It's, it's been a, a fundamental transformation or a breakdown in, in what they call that old-time fiscal religion, which is the idea that debt is something that needs to be paid off and needs to be avoided. So you think about after World War I, uh, the government, the, Fed, the U.S. government paid off its debts relatively quickly. Right, It was a very expensive war. There's no denying that. But we paid it off. After World War II, we paid it off, right? But now we have, you know, the war on terror. We have the war on poverty. We have the war on, uh, I, we have the war on like underdevelopment around the world, right? And we call them wars, by the way, which is always interesting, right? Because I've never seen a bullet fly to try to cure poverty, but maybe they have. But 
regardless. There's this comes from James, right? The uh, yeah. the moral equivalent of war <laughs> right. being, you know, that uh, you even see this in reviews of the early progressive era, the obsession with like, you know, World War II was terrible because of all the killing, but if only we could get people to organize and sacrifice and do the kind yeah. of things that you're willing to do in war yeah. um, for a different cause and you get this explosion of, you know, you know, war on poverty, war on drugs, all of these things that um, whatever it is that we declare war on always seems to be winning. Yeah. So – so there's been a fundamental change, I think, in the American people over the 20th century. And the idea is that we moved away from understanding that debt is something to be avoided and toward something akin to saying spending is good, right? We need to have more spending. And when there's a problem, the problem is solved by throwing money at it. And if – the other thing that I, th I think is important is we've, we've undersold the Tenth Amendment, which is the one that says, you know, the power is not explicitly granted to the federal government or reserved for the states. In that sense, what we've seen is something akin to, you know, if you can't get your way at the local level, right, what do you do? Well, you move up to the state level and try to get it done, you know, at your state's level. If you can't get it done at the state level, you try to elevate it to a national issue. And to me, there are plenty of things that are state-level decisions. There are plenty of things that are local-level decisions. So like we're in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and one of the lakes nearby is Reeds Lake. It's a fairly large lake, not super big, but big enough to have a speedboat on and have a little bit of fun. We certainly would want that lake to be taken care of, right? I certainly – I don't want to see it polluted. I don't want to see it, you know, destroyed. Uh, but who should be in charge of that? Well, probably Grand Rapids, right? Probably not Lansing. Right? And the reason is because we as Grand Rapidians understand, you know, the lake, its uses, what it's for, right, and why it's there. We understand that better than anyone in Lansing could ever, you know, understand. But imagine you had someone who wanted to ban, you know, power boats on Reeds Lake and they tried to do it at the local level. Well, no one at the local level is going to say yes because we all enjoy going out on the lake, right? Uh, but maybe in Lansing where you have a far fewer number of people who – don't benefit from being on Reeds Lake or near Reeds Lake, they might be willing to say, yeah, that makes sense. It's an environmental issue. We need to solve this, right? And so you can get what you want at a higher level if you fail to get it at the local level. And I think what we've seen is a lot more issues that probably are better solved at local levels are instead solved at federal levels where, let's face it, there's far less accountability at the national level than there is at the local one. You know, in, in so I live in East Grand Rapids. The mayor of East Grand Rapids lives right down the road. I know her. She comes over for Christmas, right? We go to the potluck on our street every summer. It's super fun. So if she does something, I know where she lives. And I can just go say, hey, uh, can we talk about this? Right? I think you made a mistake. And she's super open. She's a great lady. I actually really like her. We don't see eye to eye on everything, but I can respect her. But when it comes to my federal representatives... I don't even know who they are, to be completely honest. And I'm somewhat ashamed to admit that since we just had midterm elections and I should know who they are. But like, I don't know, right? I could find out and I could write their office an email, but then I'd get some intern, you know, writing me back on stationery or whatever, right? And, you know, they'd have their auto pen that would sign it. And so like, there's just no accountability at that national level. And in fact, there might be like what we could consider negative accountability where the national level people just want to spend money. And if you propose something that involves spending money, they're all for it. I'm reminded of the quote from Milton Friedman, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. Um, it, it was This was cheapened in general uh, in the uh, late 2000s by Rahm Emanuel's uh, approximation of it in mm -hmm. saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is this the kind of thing where the only way you're going to get changes to the kind of you know, fundamental spending problems that you're laying out here is going to be because a crisis precipitated it? Because you come back to that appetite problem, right? Mm -hmm. People want the benefits. 
Yep. They don't want to pay a lot for them. Right. And they've been able to get by that way for quite a while. And this is why I've, I've appreciated uh, – we've had David Bonson on this program a number of times. Yeah. And David always makes the point about the inflation that we are currently experiencing in his mind being primarily a supply-side problem, okay. not a demand-side problem. Because yeah. he, you know, we go back to yep. the Friedman definition of uh, yeah. inflation. It is too uh, much money chasing too few goods and services. And right. David's point is the emphasis should be on the too few goods and services. Services. We right. shut down the economy for a year because of a pandemic. Supply yep. chains have been massively disrupted. Yep. It's mostly a supply side problem, not a demand side problem. Yep. But we're, we get a lot of political conversation as if it is a, uh, a demand side problem. Yeah. Um, and spending has been has created this problem. So we are, you know, we have this current inflation problem. Mm -hmm. We've been told for years that we're heading towards some kind of a fiscal calamity. You know, I have friends that make the joke about uh, you know, Ron Paul or other libertarians who've uh, predicted 12 of the last two um, or yeah, 12 of the last two recessions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> is it going to take a crisis like that to get people to actually think seriously about how we structure programs like Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, the big drivers of government spending, um, because there's just not going to be an appetite to want to address them absent the sense that this thing is imploding on us and we can't continue this way. So regretfully, I, I kind of think the answer is yes. And my reasoning is not because I'm pessimistic about the American people. Or, or desirous of a calamity or yeah, crisis I'm not, situation. Certainly not desirous of one, right? I do not wish this upon, upon ourselves or anything of the sort. But here's, here's kind of my reasoning uh, in thinking about this. So you are absolutely correct to point out that, you know, libertarians, conservatives, and even progressives have called or, or predicted 12 of the last two recessions, right? And the reason is because calamity or declaring something to be a future calamity is a really easy way to get a lot of eyes to look at you and then have your message spread. The problem with that is that it becomes sort of like the boy cried wolf, right? Where you say it all the time, it cheapens the alarm bells that might be ringing. And so when you do that, when the alarm bells truly do ring, people ignore it, right? It's the same thing like the smoke detector in my kitchen whenever I cook the dinner. I basically consider that the timer, right? Because when the smoke alarm goes off, I know that dinner is, is overdone, right? If it hasn't gone off, dinner might not be done yet. Right. And so when I hear the smoke alarm in the kitchen, do I think there's a fire? No, I think I just left something in the oven. Right. But someday, if I'm not careful, there will be a fire in the kitchen and that'll be a big problem for me. Right. And my family. Okay. Uh, hopefully I avoid that. I will do everything I can to do so. Uh, but in the national, you know, federal budget sense, you know, we've declared problem after problem after problem and nothing's really happened. Right? I mean, sure, we've had government shutdowns. Sure, we've had you know, debates about how big the federal debt is. Right? And that's true. The U.S. current you – know, the current debt to GDP ratio is 107 percent for the U.S., right? which means that we could take everything the United States produces for the next year and throw it just at the U.S. federal debt and we still wouldn't pay it off. Right? That's pretty large. Uh, to compare – to give you some comparison, Germany is only about 58 percent, which is you know, kind of low. Right. Uh, Russia apparently only has a 19.6 percent, but I don't really trust any statistics coming out of Russia at the moment. But uh, nor could we trust any statistics coming out of China. Correct. Um, right. You know, so the, I had this yeah. uh, trying to remember Derek Scissors at uh, American Enterprise Institute, his economic analysis of anything coming out of China yeah. always starts with if you can believe China's numbers, which you can't. Mm -hmm. Here's what it says. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so so there are some countries where like I don't trust the numbers, but I do trust the U.S.'s numbers. I do trust Germany's numbers. Uh, Japan is at 237. 7% debt to GDP. That's very high. Um, I do trust their numbers. Uh, and so when you think about that, or to put it in other, you know, frame, another way to frame it is every single American could pay $80,000 in taxes right now, man, woman, and child, like under age 16 included. Uh, and we still wouldn't pay off the federal debt, right? And so when you, when you notice stuff like that, I think that's when you can start to see that we're headed toward an actual cliff. Maybe we can quibble about, you know, how far in the future the cliff is. But if we're constantly moving toward it and we refuse to acknowledge that there is a cliff and steer away from it, eventually at some point we have to fall off the cliff. You can't do like a wily e. coyote thing where you can, you know, go off the cliff and until you look down, that's when you fall. Not going to happen, right? Not how physics, not how accounting works. 
And so I do think it, it might take some sort of a calamity. Now, hopefully it's a small calamity, right, that we look at, you know, what's going on and we say, you know, okay, we're spending a lot of money on these things, right? We're not getting what we need. It's clearly something that's not sustainable from a, a business or accounting standpoint or even just a, a human flourishing standpoint. We need to change. Now, what will that change look like? I don't know, right? Adam Smith talks about the juggling trick of public officials, you know, to uh, inflate the currency, to pay off debt, right? To debase the currency. You can run debt, you can run deficits, right? Those are the three big tricks that Adam Smith describes. And in a world where we can always just inflate the currency and pay off our debts with that, that's going to be a problem, right? That's going to introduce problems down the line. But I guess in a world where we have elected officials, who only serve a certain number of terms, who can always kick the can down the road. I don't know that I can rely on them to actually do what needs to be done, to sort of tie their hands to the mast like Odysseus in, or yeah, like Odysseus, right? Um, I don't know that I can rely on them to do so. And that's where things become difficult. So the Acton Institute's mission is uh, to promote a vision of a free and virtuous society. Uh, as we come to a, a close here, I wonder if you could connect the how you see the nexus between the way that we have managed uh, our national economic circumstance, the things that you have laid out mm -hmm. in this piece that really gives perspective on uh, just how much spending is going on, how um, out of proportion it is to what is affordable, at least again by people's willingness to actually pay for things and uh, a sense of is this a virtuous way to act um, politically right. uh, you know we've, we've talked a lot about how do we solve these problems but I really just like to nail uh, drill down on you know is is the virtuous thing to be you know the politician in the position of saying things that people uh, do not want to hear right. um, so I wonder if you expand any on that connection as you see it yeah so I would say you know the purpose of any society, whether it's, you know, governed by a federal government or a bunch of local governments, is to expand the freedoms of individual people to interact in ways that bring them, you know, satisfaction, however you choose to define those. And we can get into like natural rights and, you know, you can't uh, infringe on other people's natural rights. But basically, it's, it's the freedom of association and the ability to use your God-given talents to serve the rest of the community in a way that is also pleasing to you, right? But you have to do that against the backdrop of responsibility, right? And it's good stewardship of the resources. The last thing we want to see are people wasting these scarce and valuable resources. And it's important to note that all of the money that Congress or any government collects in taxation is ultimately money that was earned through people working, through people serving their community. And so if you're going to effectively take the money that people have earned in the service of others and use that money for something else, you need to be very responsible with that money. Like you're making a very big claim to say that you, in this case, the federal government, you know how to spend that money better than any other citizen in the country. And so that's a very large, very big, very hard to defend claim. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible to meet those criteria. I certainly believe that there are things that the federal government should spend money on. Uh, but it's still a very bold claim to make that the federal government knows better than the people that earned the money. And so if you're going to do that, you have an obligation to be responsible. Spending more money than you're taking in is, to me, a sign of very irresponsible behavior. Now, surely debt is not something to be completely avoided. So I don't want to sound like a, a Dave Ramsey, you know, consp a, a debtaholic kind of person. Uh, debt can be great, right? College debt, for example, enabled me to go to college and live a more fulfilling life. I've paid off my college debt. You know, having a mortgage means you can live in a house that you don't have the cash for, but you could reasonably expect to make payments. So there's reasons to go into debt and they're good. Right? It's not something that needs to be completely avoided. But when you get to a level where the debt itself is nigh impossible to pay off, when you get to a level where it would take 690 winnings of the, of the Powerball to pay off just this year's deficit, right? when you get to a point where the number of dollars that you're spending 
if you stacked up single dollar bills, would reach the moon and almost back. Or if you laid them out end to end, would go to the sun and back three times and still have change left over. You're getting to a point where you have to look at it and seriously wonder, is this necessary? Is this a responsible use of the money that I have taken from other people for my own purposes? Dave Hebert, thanks so much for joining us today on Active Money. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Combs.